everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our 36th episode of the Clements Bookworm, and I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library and your host for today. Today's meeting is being recorded to share online. And in fact, this afternoon, you'll receive an email with the recording and any resources mentioned in today's broadcast. If you're joining us for the first time, um, or maybe would like a reminder about how we utilize Zoom, we like to think of this as something um, that you're participating in as an audience. So we're pleased to have you participate in the chat. Uh, if you change, oh, I didn't change this yet. I forget what it actually says. All attendees, I think it says now. Um, but just, just change it so we can all see it that way. That way we can all participate in the conversation. And uh, mm -hmm. if you have questions for our panelists, since the chat goes by very quickly, please put your questions in the Q&A section. There you can also see the questions that other people are asking. And if you give it a thumbs up, it will send that question to the top of the queue. We have the live transcript turned on today as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion program. If you would like to toggle that on or off, you can do so um, where you see that little CC button. You can also change the size of the words that you're seeing. I can only control, however, so much of what you see on your screen. So I do have side-by-side -side mode enabled. That should allow you to see both the slides and the speakers. You can move the separator to change the relative size of each. You can also um, choose to have either gallery or speaker view if you want to see all of us or just whoever is speaking. And um, my colleagues, Ann Bennington Helber and Tracy Paovich are online to help it with the chat and any questions that people have. Um, but if you don't want to see them when you're in gallery view, you can uh, select to turn off um, the people who aren't showing their video. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. As a descendant of the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, it is my sad privilege to acknowledge that the University of Michigan was funded by and founded on Anishinaabe lands, seated in coercive historical treaties and through the dispossession of indigenous peoples, most notably through the 1817 Treaty of Fort Meigs. The Clements Library acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. So if you haven't had a chance yet to click on our poll question, we're wondering if you've ever been to a book fair before. So go ahead and click quickly. And I am just going to end the poll and share the results. All right, it looks like we have lots of people who have been to the book fair before, 83%. So thank you so much for joining us today. And 17% uh, are saying, no, they haven't been to a book fair. So we have lots of great information for you today as well. Um, it should be a lot of fun to have this conversation. Today's episode is generous, generously sponsored by Jean and Robert Julier, who uh, are avid book collectors and enjoy attending the Ann Arbor Antiquarian Book Fair. Thank you so much, Jean and Bob. All right, so here we are. We're thrilled 
that the Ann Arbor Antiquarian Book Fair will be returning to after a longer than expected hiatus uh, due to the Michigan Union renovations and then of course the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's celebrating its 45th year this Sunday, October 17th. Booksellers Jay Platt and Garrett Scott have a long history with not only this book fair, but many across the country and are joining us today to discuss the history of the Ann Arbor Antiquarian Book Fair, as well as share some tips on how to make the most of attending a book fair um, while forging new friendships and expanding or beginning a collection or just browsing to see what tickles your fancy. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jay Platt. Jay came to Ann Arbor from Virginia to attend the University of Michigan in the 60s. After graduating with a naval architecture degree, he remained in Ann Arbor and opened up Westside Bookshop in 1975. He is a member of the Midwest Antiquarian Booksellers Association, which hosts two annual fairs in Chicago and Minnesota, and is of course also an active member of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America and has served on its board. He is also an active member of the Historical Society of Michigan and served as treasurer for over 20 years. Thanks for joining us today, Jay. Thank you. We also have Garrett Scott. Garrett has been a full-time <laughs> antiquarian bookseller since 1991. He has done business in Ann Arbor since <clears throat> 1998 and Garrett as Garrett Scott bookseller. Garrett specializes in the old weird America, 18th and 19th century books, ephemera and manuscripts dealing with eccentric authors, odd subjects, popular medicine, unpopular literature, obscure imprints, and even more obscure religious movements. Garrett serves on the faculty of the Antiquarian Book Seminars and on the board of the Antiquarian Book School Foundation. He has also served on the Board of Governors of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. Welcome. Well, I know that probably the first question that any of us have for you both is, um, how is it that you became involved in the book business? So Jay, would you like to start us off telling us that story? Oh, yes. Actually, I started, boy, it's hard to say exactly the exact moment. However, I always tell people, I said, a friend of, my, a friend of mine took me into a bookshop in New York City in the old booksellers row. This was about 1970, 71. And uh, he went into the shop. I can't remember what, it might have been Dauber and Pine, one of the old shops. And he, he asked the dealer for a particular book. And he went way up in stacks someplace and found it. I said, how did he do that? How did he know that? I kind of know now because you pretty much know your stock pretty well. I mean, it, it may not look like it sometimes and you're in piles someplace, but sometimes I'll go to a bottom of a pile and there's the book. I'm, yeah, I have. Uh, but that was kind of the turning point. And then I got I got jobs in bookstore. I, I, that was kind of like turning on the light and saying, that's what I wanted to do, even though I had a degree in naval, archite uh, naval architecture. Uh, um, and I like boats. I like sailing. But uh, books turned me on and that was... Uh, kind of let everything kind of led to my opening up the bookshop in 1975. That's exciting. Thank you. Um, how about you, Garrett? Um, it, it, it traces back to the summer of 1990 when I was going to college out in California and I didn't want to go back to Illinois to take my, my summer job of working in the kitchen of the county nursing home. And so <laughs> I picked I picked out of the, the jobs binder uh, there at Stanford, a, a, a library job in special collections, which I knew nothing about at the time, uh, but they immediately put me to work uh, paging rare books uh, for, for readers in their reading room. And they just let a punk kid like me handle some of the best books uh, that I'd ever seen before. Uh, you know, seeing people use these books really kind of, uh, as I was unpacking them, you know, I would, I would unpack the parcels that came from booksellers uh, from across the nation, from around the world. And I wanted to do it. I wanted to handle this sort of stuff. So I went to the Yellow Pages back when that was still a thing and sent my <laughs> resume to every bookshop uh, in Northern California until John Crichton at the Brick Row Bookshop hired me 
uh, in the fall of 1991 after I left college um, and kind of brought me aboard to learn the ropes. Uh, in 1998, my wife finished graduate school. She got hired here in the School of Education at the University of Michigan. Uh, I shipped 53 cartons of books uh, mm -hmm. to, our, to our house on Baldwin, our rental duplex uh, set up in the basement of our duplex and started work. Uh, that was in 1998. And now I'm uh, sort of back in the cave here behind what's now York uh, on Packard and kind of work out of my cedar, you know, my, my bunker here and, <laughs> uh, and, and just try to sell books. Uh, so that's, that's how I got uh, where, I'm, where I'm sitting today. That's, that's great. That's cool. Um, so I know that it's hard to collect when you're, when you're a bookseller, but do you collect anything? Um, do you collect books or maybe something else? And, um, do you have a particular subject or genre that you're particularly interested in? Uh, yes, actually, I do. I don't really collect. I think a lot of dealers start as collectors, and I did too. I mean, I would be in certain areas, certain authors I would collect, um, Jack London, uh, uh, books on the polar regions, uh, books on small boat voyages. That was one thing I collected for quite a while. Um, and then uh, when you open up a bookshop, you can't really collect, you can't really compete with your customers. Uh, but other than that, I do collect bookends and book related objects. Um, so that's, I, I guess I'm not, you know, not a serious collector, but I've got about 50 or 60 bookends. So I guess I, it just sit on a bookshelf. <laughs> they're not holding up any books. They're just sitting there. But they're, some are very nice. Some of the art deco ones. So yes, I do collect that. And I probably collect books, books about books, or, but that's really a reference library. So it's not really collecting. Right. But yeah. <laughs> But but definitely, if you have fifty or sixty uh, sets of bookends, I think that counts as a collection. Yeah. Uh, what were we saying? Uh, I think Anne's mom says that uh, if you have oh. more than three of something, it, mm -hmm. it's a collection. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think. Or if you if if you tend to get two items and you tend to keep them, mm -hmm. then you're starting a collection. <laughs> right, right. I mean, some people buy a book and I read it and they. This, you know, they resell it or whatever, donate it. But if you want to keep the book, then you, you start to be a collector. Yes. Right, right. How about you, Garrett? Well, I just want to comment momentarily on, on Jay's sort of self contortions about going through claiming that his, his books about books collection is not a collection, it's really a working reference library. Uh, the, the things we tell ourselves uh, to pretend that we're not collecting and not competing with our customers. Uh, sometimes are, are a little, uh, there's a certain amount of self-justification there. And, and the self-justification I use is that I'm not collecting so much as I'm building collections uh, mm -hmm. with an eye toward eventually disposing of them. Uh, and by disposing, oh, okay. I mean, I hope selling them. Um, yeah. Though some of my material, I'm not entirely certain. So I'm going to quickly share my screen and show mm -hmm. one of the things that I do uh, that sort of dovetails with the kinds of things I handle in the shop. And that is, if you'll just hold on momentarily here. So I'm really interested in how books as objects are used, uh, especially in 19th century America. Uh, again, books are things. They're not just the texts that mm -hmm. they contain. They're also the items that people pick up, hold, interact with. Uh, so I will have, uh, I've been building for the last several years, a collection that's grown to maybe three or 400 items of what I call vernacular bindings or uh, homemade repairs and modifications uh, to American books. Uh, so I have shelves of uh, added cloth dust jackets and dust covers uh, or momentarily here, uh, we've got uh, added paper dust jackets as with this cartridge paper dust jacket. <clears throat> added to an 1830s uh, American Materia Medica or, or pharmacology book. Uh, it, was, it was a working dust jacket covering the book. Uh, or there are uh, added leather dust jackets, uh, mm -hmm. often you see on earlier American books uh, that were protecting, uh, stitched on, beautifully stitched on often, mm -hmm. and protecting the original books. Uh, I've got a friend and colleague, Don Lindgren, uh, out of Maine, who, who trades under the name of Rabelais Books. He specializes in 
uh, books about food and drink. And he's written about the physical use of cookbooks and the evidence of mm -hmm. uh, how cooks use them. And he, he has said that uh, people used what was handy uh, to, to cover their books. Um, and in early America, you couldn't get paper that easily, but you could always get scrap leather. Uh, so that tells a story about how books were used, how things were used uh, in a certain time in a certain place. Uh, I also like when scrap papers used to cover common books, uh, like ream paper here on the left, used on an early American almanac, uh, or repurposed wallpaper uh, here on the right, which was also used for an early American almanac. Again, uh, the scraps of daily life being used to kind of preserve uh, the material that people used on a daily basis. Uh, or this is a uh, an example of a repair, a very nice repair done uh, to a book published in 1850 in Poland, uh, which is Poland, Ohio, uh, a small town in Mahonan <laughs> County. Uh, it's a German hymnal. Uh, ordinarily, you wouldn't cross the street for a German language hymnal, uh, but uh, this beautiful painted leather added uh, spine uh, kind of glued on to hold the boards on. Uh, it tells a story about how this book was used and 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 the relationship of the book's owner uh, to the book, and it's just a lovely item. And uh, you know, and and this, for instance, Jay, you might like this. This is a sailcloth binding uh, that's been mm, used no. on an early American naval register. Uh, no so way. clearly, the working material at hand was used to cover the book. And and the book, as you see, is damp stained, uh, which I don't mind so much when you've got a naval book. It, it shows <laughs> the book was being used. And, and I, like, I like it, you know, speaking of damp stains, I've got this book from the, uh, a, a pioneer Michigan brethren uh, traveling preacher uh, named James Qua, who is involved in a baptism controversy. This is a nice early Detroit 1844 imprint. Um, and I always find it kind of funny when uh, books about baptism are also water stained. Uh, I think it, it says something about, uh, again, how books exist in the world. Uh, just the same way I can never resist, uh, this is going a little further afield, uh, describing books as a little rubbed uh, whenever they have something to do with the onanism panic, uh, which uh, happened, uh, which really launched in the 18th century. This is a, an Italian edition of uh, uh, Samuel Auguste Tissot. He was a Swiss physician uh, who wrote about the medical threats of the solitary vice. Uh, so <laughs> books exist as things. And this collection that I've been putting together I hope someday we'll help tell the story of, of how Americans use books. Uh, stop by the booth, I'll have the Tissot with me, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about, about how books have been used. And that gives you a little sense of how I like to look at things, uh, the things that come across my desk uh, when, I'm, when I'm working. And, and that's, we'll, get, we'll get into cholera a little bit later when we, when we want to <laughs> talk about. Uh, let me get out of sharing my screen. And that's a little bit about what I collect uh, and what I handle. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for those visualizations, especially since yeah. that's part of what you're so interested in. Um, it's funny, I, it made me think about high school and covering books with paper <laughs> uh, grocery bags. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we use we use what we have handy. That's that's exactly exactly same same now as it was then. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, so I guess one of the other things we're interested in is the history of the um, Ann Arbor Antiquarian Book Fair. It seems like there's some stories to tell there. So mm -hmm. including Jay, mm -hmm. we see some flyers saying 41st year, some people saying 45th year. So, so we need mm -hmm. a little history around that as well. Well, good. Thank you. Um, well, the Ann Arbor Antiquarian Book Fair was first held in 1976, and the American Library Association was having a rare book conference here in Ann Arbor. And Bob and Ruth Eilhart of Hartfield Books and Tom Nicely and myself, well, actually it was their idea, Tom, uh, Bob and Ruth Eilhart's idea, said, let's have a book fair. And hey, sounds like a great idea. Uh, we'll have all these librarians come and buy all our rare books. And um, so we, we had it in the league um, in the middle of July. We had maybe 10, 12 dealers. I think they were all Michigan, I mean, all relatively local. Um, and we had an opening evening with the wine and 
cheese and crackers and things like that. And they came for that, but they didn't really buy many books. And then and it was a three-day fair. It was a Friday evening. So Saturday and Sunday, we sat around looking at each other's books. And <laughs> I think maybe a few dozen people showed up, but it was it was a little discouraging. So we didn't do it the second year. I mean, we didn't, that was 1976. So in 1977, we skipped a year. Now we got together again and said, well, let's try it again. And we moved to the union and we had it in the Anderson room for a couple of years. And um, it was, uh, we had a few more dealers, but it, they were always good fares. Um, but then it, it, uh, the point is that we were uh, running the fair as a committee. And, uh, and usually over at Bob and Ruth Eichelhardt's house and the wine was flowing freely. And um, so we'd plan these things and it was, you know, and then one year we, I think it was number eight. And then we next year, I think it was number seven. And then we just planned the next one. It was number seven again or whatever. <laughs> so we, yeah, what, what difference does it make? So, and, um, and then we, uh, so that, that kind of explains the difference between the 45th year, it's been since 1976 to 2021 is 45 years, but this, and so we skipped the last two years. So that kind of explains the difference in the numeration of the fairs. Um, it's, uh, so it really is the 41st actual fair that we've had, but it's been going on for 45 years. So that's, um, but we've, it's, it has grown since then, of course, and we've moved to the uh, Pendleton room for a year or two, and then, then to the ballroom where it's been for the last, gosh, 25 years or so, which is really a, a, a beautiful place for the fair. I mean, we have to come up, the dealers have to come up to a freight elevator to get in, but it's worth it when we're inside because it's a really just a great venue for a book fair. Nice wooden floors, it has a certain atmosphere to it that really people appreciate. So, uh, we, we've also gotten a lot more, as I said, more dealers and a lot more dealers from around the country uh, from as far away as, uh, you know, we had a couple, one time we had a couple of Canadian dealers, but from New York, uh, this, time, this time, this year we have a couple of dealers from Washington, D.C., uh, also from New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin. So, uh, so we do, we try to get a, a broad range of dealers and from different parts of the country to bring new material to the fair. Right, right, right. That's great. Um, so one of the other things that I was thinking about, of course, COVID-19 has, has changed so many things, but normally uh, we would have this in uh, spring, usually more like April or May. Yeah. So it, have you had it in the fall before? No, this is the first time. Actually, early on, we had it, uh, other than that first fair in July of 76, we had it in February a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we moved it to March. And then uh, more, more, more recently, of course, it's been in April, I mean, uh, in May. One time we had to move it, I think two years, two and a half years ago, we moved it to March again. But generally it's been in the spring. It's always been in the spring. And this is really the first time in the fall. So it's kind of a new, um, new experience. We'll see what the, how the attendance is, uh, uh, since the students will be here. Um, uh, anyway, so we'll, we'll see. It's a kind of an experiment, but I think it was a, a wise move to move it to the spring this year. And, and if it works well, we may keep it in the fall. So Yeah, so but we'll just see, you know, mm -hmm. we have to be adaptable, right? Um, exactly. So Garrett, how long have you been involved with the book fair? So my first book fair uh, was, in fact, on my 30th birthday, uh, May 14th, 1999. Uh, and every, every every wrinkle on my face since then, Jay, <laughs> it's because of that freight elevator. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it, so I've, I've done it every time I could. And, and uh, one of the great things about the fair is this kind of uh, continuity where you often see many of the same dealers in the same place in the ballroom every year and there's a there's a comfort to knowing that you can go back and see what have they gotten since the last time I, I saw them while at the same time there's often new dealers who haven't done the fair before it's a really nice entry-level fair uh, given the sort of time and expense uh, for younger dealers or for dealers who uh, you know are, are just trying to get into doing book fairs there's uh, you know some friends of mine Alexis and George Sorakos uh, Walnut Street paper uh, from Reading Pennsylvania uh, 
this will be their first Ann Arbor Fair this year. Uh, and they've got some great stuff. Uh, and so it's a good way, you know, Alain Golay uh, and Aaron Beckwith, these are the two dealers from Washington, D.C. who are coming. Uh, you know, they're going to have some great stuff too. Um, and and uh, it's, it's great that people can take that chance and sort of come in and, and just sort of uh, be seen, see and be seen. So I do appreciate uh, getting a chance to get out and kind of actually see people. You get, you get sort of isolated behind the desk uh, just mm -hmm. quoting stuff out to to customers. It's it's nice to get out and actually, uh, well, I won't be shaking as many hands this year, but to to meet people, see people, and uh, and to see their stuff. So uh, I guess that puts me in what are we at? about 30, 30 something years of doing the book. Yeah. Good God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my history of the book fair, and I'm I'd I'd be interested in hearing uh, who holds the record besides Jay. Uh, for for the most times going to the book fair, uh, not necessarily exhibiting. So if there's anyone out there who's an Ann Arbor book fair warrior, uh, jump uh -huh. in, uh, jump in on the comments there. I'd like to sort of match up. Maybe I can buy a cup of coffee for the oldest uh, attending <laughs> uh, book fair uh, attendee this weekend. Uh, just come by the booth and redeem it with me. Yeah. As far as well, dealers, I think myself and uh, Kira, uh, Ray Walsh from Curious Bookshop. Probably the and Tom. Well, Tom did it for a number of years, but then he stopped doing it. But he's coming back for the first time after about a twenty-year hiatus from doing book fairs. He'll be back. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, there are a few. But I looked at some of the old programs and I said, boy, a lot of them are gone, or a lot of them haven't. You know, I haven't seen those people in years. But uh, so I was hang on. Yes, <laughs> yes. still going. Sorry, sorry about my uh, dog, my old dog who normally sleeps soundly through <laughs> through this program. Even startled me. Did you see that? I was like, "Whoa, you don't you don't bark." <laughs> Saw something out the window. Anyhow, um, speaking of new people, so you talked about some of these new uh, book dealers, but also maybe talking uh, about what somebody new to the book fair might experience. And I know, Garrett, you have some, some great tips for that. Well, Jay, Jay, do you want to just sort of jump in and give kind of a, a quick overview of what someone might expect at the fair? And I can kind of then walk us through maybe okay. how to look how to look for things besides just just a, a, a book on a shelf and, mm -hmm. and some things you could do with, with other materials? Yeah, um, I think what, what you'll find, I mean, as we, we're gonna have, I think 27 dealers, uh, separate dealers, and a lot of them specialize in certain areas. Some of them are all gonna be different as one uh, dealer specializes in children's books. Uh, people like Garrett and, and Walnut Street Paper and uh, Peter Luke are gonna be more ephemeral material, uh, more, you know, other people will have modern first editions. Uh, um, uh, yeah, and a lot of them will just have just good general stock. But each dealer will have some kind of specialty, something they're really uh, more expert in, I would say. So it's so you'll see a lot of different things. Um, and the fair is small enough that you have time to really look at all the booths. And it's, it always pays to, even if someone specializes in a particular area, they're going to have something else. So it's always good to ask. If you come to a booth and say, do you have anything like about this or or have a question about a book? Uh, and that's the other part of the book, uh, other part of a book fair. It's really partly educational too. Uh, a little a little history back in the, uh, 1960, the ABA put on their first antiquarian book fair and it was a week long. And I think they had maybe 20 dealers or something. And the, the point was that it was really educational. It was really to introduce people to the antiquarian book trade. They could meet the dealers, they could actually see the books. And uh, it's evolved, it's more of a commercial enterprise now, but it is also, I think its original mission is still valid. And that is that you can, you can learn about the books and you can see things that you won't see anyplace else. I mean, you can, it's just like going to an antique show, but it's the antique books, but they're all old. I mean, antique, that's a kind of a, a loose term, but I would say, books that are interesting and you're not going to see other places and they're not, it's not like a new bookstore. I mean, these are books that are, many of them are out of print. Uh, and just, a, it's a, I mean, that's the thing about the used and rare book business is that they're, 
it, it's almost infinite, the number of books, whereas a new book business is kind of limited to what's in print. So, so it really can open up horizons and that's what a book fair does. And okay. <laughs> Uh, I just received notice that my internet connection is unstable. So if if I kind of cut in and out over the next few moments, uh, please no. cut and my I little thought slack. I, and I, I thought it was you that were unstable, but that's yeah. Well, it's it's <laughs> like like bookseller like internet connection. Yeah. So I'm gonna often and and I see that given that so many of the folks out there in the audience today have been to book fairs before, you probably already understand that book fairs are about more than just books. Um, sometimes you'll walk into a book fair and it will just be sort of uh, a range of sort of spines uh, staring at you. Uh, but but like Jay said, go into those booths and and dig around a little bit or, or talk to the bookseller, uh, get into a conversation about the sorts of things that they might have. And so I, I'm gonna try to, by using a few of the things that I'm bringing, uh, try to sort of talk a bit about the variety of material that that's out there and and why you want to look at the stuff that's not just you know a, a book fair or antiquarian books uh, aren't just aren't just those sort of beautiful fancy leather bound mm -hmm. items with gilt lettering on them uh, you know sometimes they can be something as simple as this tract here uh, you know this tract on cholera, tracts are common throwaway things. They're meant to be read, considered, and then tossed. Uh, this was issued by the American Tract Society uh, in 1832, uh, when America was in the grips of its first cholera epidemic. Uh, it takes the expected line that you would want to hear from the American Tract Society, which was that, you know, we were being visited by cholera basically because we were a, 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 a nation that had strayed from God and uh, developed all sorts of vices and bad habits. Uh, 160,000 copies of this tract uh, were, were printed, published, and distributed. Uh, but now today, you know, you go on, you go on online catalogs, there's maybe five or six copies held in American libraries that have been cataloged. Uh, it was in the hands of many, many Americans back in the day mm -hmm. when we were trying to formulate a national response to a fatal epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a way of sort of framing how we think about uh, how something that was literally meant to be just sort of tossed away uh, can help us think about uh, where we are today. So booksellers will have bins, uh, boxes, tubs of this sort of thing. Dig in. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I want you to do. Um, yeah. Let me see if I can, you know, other things that were usually meant to be used and then thrown away uh, were almanacs. Uh, often you'll find things like uh, temperance almanacs, which you think would be doubly deadly uh, for interest, <laughs> because uh, who wants to have someone tell you you can't uh, occasionally lift lift a cup? But but the uh, Massachusetts Temperance Union, their annual almanacs, you know, the detail that I'm sure everyone's already picked up on here, is this title page vignette of a woman working the printing press. Uh, any image of a working woman in American uh, 19th century America is is great, and I love the way that this is a suggestive thing uh, that uh, you know tells us more about how uh, women actively worked uh, in American reform. Uh, literally, were doing work uh, to make things better uh, for Americans' daily lives. Uh, or take or take something you know which you might also ordinarily not want to take a second look at, and that's a book of sermons. Uh, you know, this, this little book here uh, are sermons by a guy named Jedediah Burchard, uh, published in Burlington, Vermont in 1836. You know, Burchard was a revivalist preacher. He got out there and he made people weep and fall on their knees and come to God. And this, of course, drove people, uh, you know, the more staid uh, clergy nuts. Uh, they hated that this guy uh, was out there making people cry. Uh, so uh, Chauncey Goodrich, uh, tried to collect some of Burchard's sermons just so he could show everyone, you know, how <laughs> how pernicious they were. Uh, so he hired a shorthand stenographer to go out there and start recording Burchard's sermons. And everything was going fine until Burchard convinced uh, the stenographer uh, that if he published the sermons, uh, he would probably go to hell. 
uh, uh, there's also allegations that that Burchard also bribed the stenographer. But uh, you know mm. whether or not that's true. Uh, certainly, uh, the sermons didn't see print until Goodrich was able to hire uh, another stenographer, uh, who, who who apparently did not fear quite so much for his soul. Uh, and this book was published, and there's a story behind it. And again, uh, if you pick something up and it looks maybe interesting, ask the bookseller. I'm sure the bookseller would be more than willing uh, to tell you uh, tell you a little bit more about it. You know, here's a little ephemeral thing that you might find digging through my tubs. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, a little pamphlet published about 1906 by a publisher uh, named H.H. H. Hill uh, in New York. Uh, it's just a collection of like, you know, slightly suggestive song lyrics, uh, advertisements for cheap books. But, you know, in there between Sporty George Could Do It Every Night uh, or in the parlor with the lamp turned low, you look down at the bottom of this sort of extended shaggy dog joke. You've got advertisements for Fanny Hill, which is one of the most famed American dirty, well, English dirty books out there. You could go to jail for selling this book uh, in 1906 in New York uh, on charges of obscenity under Comstock laws. So you got to dig deep in this otherwise unassuming stuff that you might throw away. And you'll find evidence that, you know, our forefathers and foremothers, you know, they weren't the sort of staid uh, one-dimensional people we might sometimes think they are. Get into the stuff that's in a, the material stuff that's in a book fair booth. You know, there's going to be manuscript material there. You know, this is a 1837 letter from a, a, an Nestorian missionary in Azerbaijan uh, back to a professor in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, talking about the progress that the Perkins mission is making uh, in Western Persia. Uh, you know, the man who wrote this letter, uh, he sounds a little comical given that he just taught himself English, but he also invented written vernacular Syriac. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there are stories behind the scraps of paper that you're going to see at a book mm -hmm. fair again, mm -hmm. uh, or photographs, uh, you know, photographs were a great democratizing medium to get art into the hands of the people. This is a sculpture, a cameo, a vignette uh, by an American artist, Carolyn S. Brooks, that she uh, sculpted for the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. And one of the great things about this sculpture by an American woman artist is that it's made entirely of butter. Uh, mm -hmm. She constructed it out of butter, and it was on display at the Centennial Fair. Uh, I'll have this, you know, it's, America was weird. America is great. <laughs> and, and there's material culture out there. And it doesn't have to be the stuff of grand history. Uh, this is uh, an American real photo postcard. Uh, it's judging by the print stock, it's probably was printed sometime between about 1907 and 1915. And it's just a family photo. But when you pick things up and you take a closer look and you see there are people like these women who are enjoying themselves immensely. And until I had picked up this photo, I wouldn't have, you can imagine yourself into somebody else's story by handling the material that comes your way at a book fair. And that is the greatest thing about a book fair is you can, and as, as a bookseller, you can take this stuff home. Um, I want you to pick things up. I want you to come by my booth if you're at the fair and chat with me and, and tell me some of the stories of the things that you've handled and, and why they were an entry for you uh, into collecting or into, or into having things. Um, it, it really is a wonderful way. Don't, don't be frightened of handling old stuff. Uh, if you've got mm -hmm. any misgivings, ask. Pick mm -hmm. it up, take a closer look. And, mm -hmm. and that sort of joy of the past will find a way of opening up to you. Thank you. Well, well said. Well said. Yeah, and one wonderful materials. Now, I think um, too, if people are new, they might be wondering, you know, uh, to to take home materials from a book fair is it always an expensive proposition? No, not necessarily. I would say uh, there'll be. A, I'm sure there'll be a number of things well under. $25 or, I mean, so that'd be a really a wide range of material. Uh, it, it's hard to say, I don't know what the cheapest thing, I mean, because they got to remember dealers are coming from it, a lot of them are coming from quite a distance and not going to bring, you know, $2 books. So, um, but uh, they will bring interesting things. Not every, not every old book is expensive by any means. And, uh, and some new books become expensive because they're in demand or whatever. Uh, so there'll be a wide range of material. I don't think uh, uh, 
you know, I, I can remember back when I started, I mean, I think, boy, a book over $5 was expensive. Paying $10 for a book, yikes. <laughs> but, um, you know, for a first edition or something, you know, but uh, that's how you start. You know, you've got to start, you start small, but once you get, once, once you, once you get bitten by the book collecting bug, you, you're lost after that. So, just <laughs> And, and I'd start like to, small, but grow big. <laughs> right. And, and I'd like to point out that there are, um, you know, you can get an idea of some of the ways that people can put together interesting collections of material, uh, often for an investment of, of time, but not necessarily of money by looking at things like the Honey and Wax uh, Women's Young Bookseller Collection. Uh, one of our local uh, uh, archivists, uh, Caitlin Moriarty, was an honorary mention uh, this year for her collection of, of Russian travel material. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, look, uh, I'll try to have some lists of resources later today, but um, collegiate book collecting contests and the Honey and Wax Young Collectors Contests are both ways to see uh, collections that have been put together of very interesting material and not necessarily uh, pricey material. So uh, with a little imagination, Oh, apparently the internet problem <laughs> finally won against Garrett. But I'm assuming with a little imagination, you can put together interesting things. So, um, well, while we're waiting for him to get sorted <laughs> back out, uh, Jay, I know that you've got a lot of great stories from all, all of these book fairs. And, um, I'm just wondering if you have any stories about people that you've met at book fairs. Oh boy. Um, hmm. I mean, I've done over the years, well over 200 book fairs and from coast to coast. Um, boy, I'm trying to remember some of the individual. Uh, so I think a couple of the New York book fairs, of course that draws some of the really high rollers sometimes, but. Uh, uh, I think one fair, unfortunately I was at the fair, but Jackie Kennedy, but she got in early. <laughs> they would they would let her in early to get a preview of the fair, which is really, it just doesn't happen, but that was a special. But, and, um, oh, I know uh, another interesting character. And remember back in the 1980s, there was a, a guy named Mark Hoffman, who was a famous forger and forged Mormon documents. And also, among other things, and letters and manuscripts and things like that. But I think I met him at the New York Book Fair, and uh, briefly. I don't. I don't. It, at that at that time, it didn't really register. But uh, he was quite a character, and he later on forged a thing called the Omen, the, the, uh, the Freeman's Oath, which was the first printed paper in the United States, in the continental United States. And uh, but the copy had never been found. And he, uh, but they knew what the text was and it had been reprinted later, but he, he forged a, what was sold as, a, as an original copy. And actually it was, it was considered uh, the Library of Congress and the American Antiquarian Society were considering buying it, but he was later exposed. But anyway, he was a character in the book fair. But uh, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to just trying to think of anybody interesting uh well all characters actually all book collectors are characters anyway so i guess it makes it um yeah most, most, yeah, most, go ahead. Most, yeah most serious collectors do have a bit of a bug um which makes them a little single-minded sometimes madeline yeah. kripke was a collector uh, in new york who put together a fantastic collection of dictionaries and and books related to language uh mm -hmm. and she was probably about four foot eleven and and would sort of prowl around the aisles of every book fair she could get to. And she had filled her apartment in Greenwich Village oh, right. with books. There was a, I visited her once and there was a, there was a, a space that was Madeline width on her bed. And the other half of the bed was filled with books. <laughs> and there was a chair, which she could sit on. And there was the exercise bicycle that her doctor insisted she used, but literally every other surface in the apartment uh, was filled with books. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't insist on you being a character otherwise colorful when you stop by the booth. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you have to go out of your way to be eccentric. 
uh, but I will understand if if your <laughs> conversation is focused on material uh, or mm -hmm. otherwise building your collection. So uh, again, I'm. Uh, it's uh, you're all characters in your own right. Uh, so yeah. and and we love you all, especially those of you who spend money with us. So yes. <laughs> um, I, I look forward to I look forward to uh, to seeing you to seeing you this weekend. All right. Well, um, any last thoughts about, uh, you know, why it's important to go look at the books in person and, um, mm. you know, good point, I would say. It is certainly a different experience. I mean, going into a bookshop and going to a book fair, you can actually handle the books. You're talking with a person live, uh, as opposed to online. And uh, which is just not the same experience. And I hope and I feel that people will be longing to get back to book fairs and uh, the experience that dealers like to do it. Uh, we, it's a social event for us too. I mean, we get to see some of the people I haven't seen for a couple of years. So it's really, a, it, it's a social, but also a commercial uh, uh, event for us, but it's, it's uh, uh, just getting to see people again. And that's, I think that's what the real heart, actually, uh, I remember um, uh, one of the dealers out in the West Coast said that how people start becoming book collectors, they often go into a bookshop. That's how they're first introduced to it. And they know, say, you know, either they don't realize ever they, they you can't buy you if a book's out of print, you, you can't find it. But if you go into a bookshop, you realize there's a whole world out there. And I think that's true. I think open, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan, obviously, because I have one, but of open bookshops. And I think that's an important part of the trade. And I hope uh, we, we've lost a number of them, but I hope that number, number, enough of them survive that we'll get more collectors coming up that, uh, uh, that way. And I would just jump in to say that the Jay's point that real estate being what it is nowadays, uh, mm -hmm. it is harder to find a good open bookshop handling antiquarian materials. So right. a book fair, getting back to in-person book fairs is a way of putting stuff into people's hands. Exactly. Um, and as Jay has pointed out, a book fair can be an educational thing, uh, even on an informal way. So, uh, so I'm looking forward, uh, despite some of my trepidation, I'm looking forward to seeing people in person. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm never happier than when I'm putting something in somebody's hands and they're getting excited about it. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've missed that aspect of mm -hmm. selling books. And yeah. um, if I seem a little giddy on Sunday, that's probably what's happened. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it'll be it'll be nice to see people. And it'll be nice to see people handling the material. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. So um, I'm going to do just a couple of housekeeping announcements, but I want to remind everybody to please put your questions in the Q&A section, and we will get to those momentarily. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing that conversation. So. We certainly, as you can tell from this discussion, hope to see you on Sunday if you're in the area. Uh, join, uh, join us in the Rogel Ballroom at the Michigan Union from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Admission is just $5 and benefits the Clements Library. Jay, Garrett, myself, and many of your other friends from the Clements Library will be there, and we really look forward to visiting with you. Please note that masks are required inside at all university buildings, and that you will also need to show that you've completed the Responsa Blue COVID-19 symptom screening. All right, because you are already registered for the bookworm, whoops. There we go, click, there we go. You'll receive um, reminders about upcoming sessions. And if you are unable to attend live, you'll still receive the email with the link to the recording and the resources. And next month, we will be recognizing American Indian and Alaska Native Heritage Month. And I will host Dr. Veronica Passfield to discuss her continuing research to understand the full purpose and force of federal Indian boarding schools. While administrators touted assimilation as a benevolent enterprise, the archives show that Indian children were used as hostages 
to secure the extraction of tribal resources and that schools were used as an instrument for transforming indigenous peoples into a permanent underclass in their own homeland. So this will be um, you know, a very thought provoking discussion and I hope that we'll see you next month. Once again, I'd like to thank Jean and Bob Julier for sponsoring today's episode of the book. And Thank all of you for being a part of our bookworm community through your participation in these webinars. We really appreciate um, the online camaraderie. If you are interested in sponsoring a future episode of The Bookworm, you can always contact myself or Anne, and we certainly appreciate that kind of support as well. All right. Let's, whoops, stop share, there we go. Let's see what kind of questions we have, shall we? All right, so Elizabeth Stone is wondering, how old does a book actually have to be to be considered antiquarian? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I, it's a, it's, there's no definite, uh, I mean, I, I think automobiles, you say over 25 years, it's an antique. Uh, Books aren't quite that uh, specific. I mean, I think they're, um, boy, I, I mean, I, I don't know, Garrett, what would you say? I mean, well, I mean you could say I, anything before 1900, you could say uh, whatever, you know, but a lot of old books, I mean, in terms of being a value, age is not really a determining factor for a lot of old books that really have little, little value, except for maybe books what are called Incanabula, which are books printed before 1501, which Incanabula means a, a swaddling clothes with the, the birth of printing, but roughly the first 50 years of printing. So those are collected just because of their age. And, and uh, but um, yeah, so I mean, but um, there are a lot of new books that have become valuable. So antique, I mean, antiquarian is, is, is not a definite term. I mean, there's no, yeah, it's not specific. I, I, I would but, suggest also that antiquarian doesn't describe the book so much as it describes the people handling the books. Uh, uh, it's well, it's it's a it's a way of saying that there's something about the item itself or or the material it covers uh, that has an interest beyond yeah. perhaps the text itself. Um, and as Jay points out, you know there are plenty of old books in the world that really aren't worth much more than a, a dollar or two, if that. Yeah. Um, so subject matter, importance, historical context. context. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if somebody walked in the door with a first edition of The Catcher in the Rye and Dust Jacket, I wouldn't quibble about whether it was old enough. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest <laughs> that it's it's a book worth having. Uh, so, so the answer to that question, as with much in this market is, it depends. Yeah. So um, I wish I had, a, I wish I could tell you a book before <laughs> 1901, Hey. but I can't, so. Yeah, I, I like the idea that it's context. I mean, I think that that's, mm -hmm. that's an important distinction. And um, so it'll be fun to, yeah. to, to continue talking about some of these questions. So, um, Matthew is wondering if either of you can talk more about the tradition of extra illustrated editions. Um, and to explain to everyone, it, that's when a reader collector rebinds the books with additional images. And how widespread was this practice and who did it? Hmm. Well, usually you had to be a person with the resources to be a, a, a print collector or otherwise accumulating extra stuff. Uh, this is a practice generally known, at least in the Anglo-American world, as grangerizing. And, and mm -hmm. I hope someone in the comments there can find a link to, to uh, Granger and, uh, and, and his practice of, of doing this, of extra illustrating books and putting them in fine bindings. Uh, one of the times that I, I, mm -hmm. I stopped my camera was so I could run across the shop and uh, pick up an example of sort of a, a semi-grangerized book. Yeah, this is a life of the American poet Fitzgreen Halleck, uh, who is now considered one of America's first important gay poets, uh, though uh, there's a lot of 
scholarship around that that question of his of his uh, milieu in early nineteenth century Knickerbocker, New York City. This is the this is the the copy that belonged to the editor of his Life and Letters, James Grant, mm -hmm. who who bound in letters relating to and by Fitzgreen Halleck and put it in a nice binding as a as a way of of making it special, making it mm -hmm. something that that told a story about his relationship to that book. And I guess that's what Grangerizing does, is it allows a collector uh, to, to, to tell a story about the item and the text using the stuff uh, mm -hmm. in a way that that is, is, is a kind of art in itself. Um, I don't handle a lot of Grangerized material, but I, it's interesting uh, when it does come my way. Mm -hmm. Jay, do you have any other thoughts? Um, not really. I, I was going to say another example of it. It's not quite Grangerizing, but in um, um, 19th century in Europe, in Italy in particular, you would buy a book and have photographs tipped in. You would go to a, 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 a little scenes of Rome and things like that. So it you take, uh, I, I think I have an example of it. I'm not sure if I'll bring it or not, but of, of uh, I can't remember what, like Anderson's theory, you know, uh, something, my hands, Christian Anderson or something, but uh, he must have written something about Italy and they would take the they would buy the book and then they would get by these photographs, little photographs that have them, have them bound in. So they all vary. And uh, it, that what makes up the book itself really isn't that valuable, but with the added photographs, they are, and they were from the, mainly the late 19th century. Yeah. Right. So Garrett, maybe just in case people can't quite envision it, do you still have that book in front of you? Can you open it to a page that sort of shows one of the letters? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, every reading room librarian out there is cringing as I sort of flop the boards around here. So I apologize in advance uh, for not having a cradle. Uh, but here, here's a... Uh, a tipped in or bound in letter uh, that in fact, you know, folds out. Uh, so it's it's just a, a way of kind of uh, the grant had of sort of keeping his material and his little archive together embodied uh, in this pretty little, I'm trying to show the gilt, you know, the mm. gilt edges on the, on it. so despite the fact that I love ugly old books, I also have a sneaking fondness for this pretty little thing um, and the way that it was used. Right, right. And I think I know at the Clements, um, when when they've these kinds of books have come her way, what what else is so interesting, of course, is that even if some even if two people were to to Grangerize the same book, mm -hmm. they'd both be completely unique. And so mm -hmm. that's that's right. also a very interesting aspect to it because it does tell its own story about whoever, whoever added those materials. But that's why I wanted you to show it though, because I knew that there was no way that those letters were um, exactly right. that size. Right. And I think that's the other thing that's always interesting is, you know, it has these moments of surprise where something mm -hmm. opens and folds out as well. So thank you. All right. Um, Ryan is wondering, uh, Jay, what your personal top three favorite genres areas are to collect? Um, uh, well, I'm prejudiced, of course, for what I carry, but I, one of the areas I specialize in are books on the polar regions, the Arctic and Antarctic, and particularly the Antarctic. So I've got, uh, I've been collecting, I used to, used to collect it, and uh, now I sell it. I did over the years did about 30 catalogs. I haven't done one in quite a while, but uh, but I have a lot of material in that area. Um, um, other areas that I'm uh, particularly interested in books on Michigan history uh, uh, and local history. Um, and there are certain authors that I always I used to collect. I think I mentioned Jack London earlier. Uh, and um, so certain, uh, I forgot, yeah, anyway, but yeah. So those are the areas I was kind of strong in, let's put it that way. Yeah. Thank you. So Francis is asking 
two book collectors buy books at book fairs? If not, how do antiquarian books find a new home? And so, so I, I think the answer is yes, but also there's lots of ways that books find a new home, right? So maybe, maybe you can speak to both of those pieces a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Well, of course, book fairs are certainly one, one way, but visiting bookshops, uh, I hate to say it, but going online, but, uh, 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 but I think you really, it's handling the books, going to book fairs, you're going to see more material, uh, a wide range of material at book fairs that you might not see at an individual shop. Um, and um, so I guess that's, that's probably the answer. I mean, if you would, yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, I, I hope that I sell books to collectors at a book fair. Yeah, um, okay. I mean, a collector, so was... a collector is more valuable to me than a book is. Uh, and once I've got one in hand, uh, it's, it's, this is another reason to do a book fair, is to meet people. And once mm -hmm. you develop a relationship with a bookseller, uh, often that bookseller will start finding stuff for you and quoting material along. Um, so I, I, I right. know at least a few of the librarians in the audience that I've seen pop up in the chat have gotten quotes from me in the past. And I'm more than happy uh, once I kind of know what you're looking for to try to put that stuff in your hands uh, just because I like to see collections grow and it helps mm -hmm. pay the rent. But also one thing that people don't often necessarily realize is how often booksellers buy from each other. Uh, mm -hmm. A book doesn't necessarily have its one true price. Um, a book about the polar regions for me is interesting, but I don't have customers for that. If uh, mm -hmm. one walked into my shop, I'd probably buy it, put a markup on it and take it to Jay. Mm -hmm. Jay has the collectors for it. it books move through a market. And, uh, right. and so don't be surprised if you don't find me in my booth necessarily on Sunday because I'm across the, the ballroom digging through somebody else's box of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So come get me. But, um, <laughs> but, but it's uh, collectors... Collectors can often find stuff at book fairs and oh, yes. develop the relationships to then find more stuff. And that's what it's about, is, is yeah. the stuff. You know, I, I think what, what I've seen both from our curators and from the collectors I know is if there's something that you already know you want, then looking for it online can possibly be productive. But, mm -hmm. Um, you know, having having relationships with booksellers who have an idea of what <clears throat> what kinds of things you want, who can who can bring some new things up to the surface, that that really makes a big difference. And then, of course, you know, you just you don't always know what you want. So going and handling the items in person is, um, you know, that that creates a whole new a whole new feel. I feel that way, like, you know, I know a lot of people in Ann Arbor go to the art fair too. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what I want at the art fair until I, until I see it, <laughs> until I interact with the artist. And I feel like the same thing is true um, many times when I'm at the book fair too. All right. So this is a good question. Betty's wondering, just because a book is printed stating first edition, how do you know if it really is a first edition? Ah, it's a good question. Uh, because each publisher, and this is, we're talking mainly about modern first editions, uh, literary first editions, where it really comes into play. Um, each publisher is, has different ways of indicating their first edition. Uh, some of them will actually say first edition, but they also have and more, more recent within the last 30, 40 years, they have what's called a number row in the, on the copyright page. And some publishers will keep that first edition, what's called a slug, <laughs> in the old uh, printing term, uh, in there. But the, the number will be number four, it'll be the fourth printing. Because uh, so, as I said, each publisher is different. So the, just because it says first edition uh, is not always true. But a lot of publishers don't say first edition, they have other ways of indicating. What is so you get a cat that know by publisher like uh, Houghton Mifflin, for example, always puts their date of the uh, on the first printing of a book. They'll put the date on the title page and they eliminate the date. That's, they're very consistent about doing that. Um, uh, Scribners uh, would put a capital A underneath the um, 
uh, copyright information on the uh, copyright page uh, starting at about 1929. And that was very, pretty consistent about that. So there are always a few exceptions. Uh, children's books are very hard. They, they're not generally not as uh, uh, fastidious about identifying first editions of children's books. So it's a little more difficult. So you really need a good bibliography. If you were collecting a particular author, get a good bibliography and they will tell you what, what to look for. So that, yes. Right, and and I saw that Dan Friedis uh, put a link in the chat uh, to the IOBA, the Independent Online Booksellers Association, uh, has a nice <clears throat> online guide for resources for identifying first editions. Uh, so I would suggest checking that out. That's also a way of finding uh, reputable dealers uh, mm -hmm. online as well. And, and oh. Another point I just well, some people will confuse uh, will con um, confuse the terms first printing and first edition. They say, well, it's a first edition, third printing. I said, well, no, no, it's it's not a first edition. And people say, oh, it's a, a or first print. I, mean, I I don't like that term. First edition, first print. Well, that's what a first edition is. So. You can't, uh, but people, and, and I think the internet has contributed to that kind of misinformation because some, you see some listings from uh, some uh, less reputable dealers will say first edition and the, the, the description will say, you know, 14th printing. So, but it's not a first edition, not from a collecting point of view. Interesting. So I know, you know, the, the two of you have learned about the book trade over the years, but um, is there, I mean, you mentioned the getting a big bibliography, but are there other ways that people uh, get information about this, this uh, topic? Well, there are books on book collecting. Uh, I think one of the Good ones, or the ones everyone should have is called the ABCs of Book Collecting by John Carter. Uh, I've gone, gone through many editions, still in print, first published in the 1930s. It's been revised a number of times, but it, it gives all the terms uh, that are used in the book trade, uh, which you really should educate yourself with. Um, the um, what was the rest of the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> What was the rest of the question? How, how, how you have learned about it over oh, the years yeah. and, and how other people could learn about it as well. well it, so. it's, it's a cumulative type thing. I don't think you can really go to a school and say, I'm going to learn to be a book collector. You pick it up over time. And uh, as I say, I mean, every day I see a book I've never seen before and I've been at a shop for 46 years. And, you know, so one thing is looking at a lot of books. <laughs> And that's how you, you, you learn. I mean, you, you just go to see as many books as you can. You'll see what's common and what's not. I mean, if you're collecting certain areas, uh, go to book sales, go to, uh, but you have to look at a lot of books. You're not going to just, and you have to handle them. And uh, so that's, I mean, that, uh, and you learn something every day. I mean, that's a, that's a fascinating thing about this business. It, <clears throat> it doesn't really get boring. No, sometimes. Most of the time, there's always something interesting coming. Yeah, that love of learning and discovery. For uh, there's a uh, uh, Alan and Pat Ahern of Quill and Brush Books. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Pat has since died, but they had done a series of price guides, mm -hmm. uh, and the prices are no longer really obtained. But the uh, the guides to the points and the editions mm -hmm. of of mm -hmm. a number of collectible of of sort of. Uh, known books uh, are collected between those covers. Uh, and they do also have author price guides that they still have PDFs of on their mm -hmm. site. So maybe someone can put the link to that resource in the chat or we can come up with it later, but that's a uh, quill and brush uh, mm -hmm. out, out in suburban Maryland. Um, and uh, any author, if you start collecting the beats, say, you know, uh, Allen Ginsberg, if it's an author that is important or that someone's heard of, there's likely an author bibliography out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Track it down. It's going to be a good investment if you've yeah. got an interest. It tells you the history of what what that author has published. And I'll mm -hmm. just put another plug in here for the uh, for CABS, the Antiquarian Book Seminar uh, that happens every summer. It was online this year. We hope to have it in person next summer at St. Olaf College in Minnesota. Uh, it's a week. It's a, sort of a boot camp about the book trade. Um, it it helps you learn to identify first editions, what it means to collate a book, what's the difference between a state and a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a different printing. Um, 
it, it uh, if you have any interest in getting into the book trade, uh, mm -hmm. it's worth it's worth a second look. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you more about that this weekend at the fair if you want to stop by the booth. Thank you. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, it looks like we're out of questions. Did did any of those questions make make you all think of anything else that you wanted to share before we sign off, or questions you have for each other? No, I, I actually I do want to state that the fair is also uh, supported by the uh, Antiquarian Booksellers Association, Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, and we'll have a table there at the fair. Uh, with information about the ABAA and what it does. And um, so that be sure to stop by. I'll have it set up, I think, near the entrance of the of the fair. So, uh, but they do help support it. They help uh, uh, give me you know, financially and uh, and in support too. And a num number of dealers, Garrett and myself, of course, are members of the ABAA and uh, we have four or five others too. So it's a good organization and I've uh, been a member since 1980. So nice, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I've got nothing else to say other than doors open at 11. Uh, if past is any uh, prologue, there may be a line. So be patient as you get your tickets. Uh, mm -hmm. And the fair is open until five. Um, if I maintain a bit of a distance, I'm being prudent, but I do want to have a chance to talk to you and put stuff in your hands. So uh, please do come out. And I look forward to getting a chance to meet some of you uh, on the floor of the fair. Great. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being here today. It was wonderful to hear your stories and all of your good information. And I'm excited to see you both in 3D in person on Sunday. So I'll be there as well. Um, have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll thank see you, you Sunday. Thank you.